Take your Bibles, if you will, to look with me now to Hebrews chapter number three. We come now to the second of five warnings in the book of Hebrews. The second of five warnings. I, I, I don't know about you, but I need a warning every once in a while. Um, I, the word is really exhortation and maybe encouragement. Uh, thank God for the warning over here on Yonce Road recently. It had bump. It was more like the Grand Canyon if you've been through, through there. there. And I'm grateful for that warning. Uh, I also like the warning in Lake Park. You better be careful going through Lake Park. They got that uh, portable uh, radar out there that tells you how fast you're going when you're coming down the street. You, you know what I'm talking about? I'm grateful for that warning. That saved me a few times coming through there. So I, I like the warnings. But this second warning is a very powerful warning in God's word. It really goes back to uh, Psalm 95 when the psalmist is talking about the faithlessness of the people of God. And it's a warning here is don't fall into the same trap that the nation of Israel fell into in just not believing God and not trusting God in that journey. Now, there's a lot of controversy over the text uh, that we are looking at today as to whether or not who he is writing to, whether he's writing to believers or whether he's not uh, writing to believers. Frankly, he is writing to believers. He's writing to people that have been delivered, that have been set free. And referring mainly back to uh, the night that the death angel uh, came over the nation of Israel and every Jewish home that had followed the will of God and obeyed God uh, took the blood of that innocent lamb and they applied the blood to the doorpost and the lintel of their house. And so when the death angel came by, the Bible says that he passed over when he saw the blood. So these are delivered people he's making reference to. Hold your spot in Hebrews there and go back with me for a moment to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And I want you to pick it up with me in verse 20. And here is the analogy. Here's what he's referring back to in the scriptures. And the Lord said, I'm, I'm reading now in verse 20 of chapter 14 of the book of Numbers. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these Ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see, they shall not see, they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now, what God had been putting up with here for 40 years, he has revealed to us in this passage of Scripture about the nation of Israel that had determined that they had much rather go back into bondage than they had to follow and believe God. They'd much rather be back in Egypt now listen, God reached a point that he said, you don't want to go into Canaan? Fine, but neither will you go back into Egypt. Uh, they were miserable people. I'll make this statement and, and I hope you understand, hope you get it today. Uh, people that are living outside the will of God are miserable people. Now I, I want you to look now at Hebrews and let's pick it up in the text. Chapter 3, beginning in verse number 7, I've entitled the message today, Don't Miss Canaan. Verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the propagation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, 
when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, here's the warning. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast in the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts into provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Uh, we could just stop here with these few verses from verse 7 through verse 19. And we could spend the next probably three months in just digging down, drilling down, and exposing all that is in this passage. But if you will permit me, what I would like to do today is just extrapolate out of these verses uh, a few truths that I believe will encourage us in the Lord today. Truth number one, write it down here. A hard heart will always test God. A hard heart will always test God. Back in verse eight, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Now the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jews who had come to faith in Christ and were tempted now to go back into a lifestyle of legalism. And before they do that, the writer says, before you yield and go back, you, you don't need to harden your hearts. Be careful that a hard heart will always test God. You, you got to come to grips with the fact that one of the things that absolutely nauseates God are the people that simply don't believe it, that don't trust him. In Acts chapter 7, verse 36, you don't need to turn there, but the Bible says that he brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years. I, I don't have to probably tell you, you're all very familiar. You learned that uh, when you were just children coming through Sunday school, uh, how that God sent Moses down to Pharaoh and he said, I want you to let my people go. And he went to there and had all of the plagues and, and, and the nation of Israel witnessed the deliverance uh, of themselves out of Pharaoh's grip. They get over to the Red Sea. God parts the sea for them to walk on dry ground. Here comes Pharaoh's army. They get into the middle of the sea and God closes it in on them and kills them. He carries them over on the other side of the Red Sea where he gives them food every day. He provides bread. He provides meat through the birds as they delivered it to him. Their, their, their shoes and the leather would not wear out. There was miracle after miracle, wonder after wonder. And what did they do? They griped, they moaned, they complained. Uh, they, they were negative about everything. And the Bible says that they hardened their hearts. Now, a hard heart will result in three things. One of them is, first of all, disregarding God's way and advancing our own way. We go before God and we say, now God, I'm in a mess here and uh, I need for you to come on the scene and I need to show you for you, you to show me what direction that I'm supposed to go in. God, would you show me what I am supposed to do? God, would you reveal to me the plan for my life? And we receive that from God, but suddenly things don't go as quickly as we think that they ought to go. And we decide that we know better than God does. And so we take things into our own hands and we do it our way. The second result of a hardened heart 
is that it always begins with the spirit of griping and complaining. I'm right now in my 43rd year of pastoring. I started in 1976. Uh, I've been a Christian since 1971. Uh, so for nearly 50 years, I've watched people, God's people, they want to progress. They want to advance. Uh, they, they want to move forward. And, and they'll say, Pastor, help us to grow. Help us to reach more people. Uh, Pastor, we, we, wanna, we wanna be on the cutting edge. Oh, but Pastor, we don't wanna change. We don't wanna do anything differently. We've done it this way for all of these years, preacher. And we, hey, by the way, I can prove that because some of you are still sitting in the same seat that you sat in 15 years ago. Now I'm asking you, don't change because what you don't realize is that I can tell whether you're here and whether you're not by where you're sitting. My wife says, what service? I says, I don't know, but I saw them sitting in their seat. So, so don't say that a third result is a hard heart results in a selfish spirit. Boy, what an entitled spirit that we have in our culture today. When, when, and we get it from a lot of these commercials, you, you, you know, that it says, have it your way. The others might say, you deserve a break today. So it'll always result in a selfish spirit. Truth number two, our behavior is determined by our heart. Our, our, our behavior, how we act, <clears throat> is determined by our heart. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in what? what? They always err where? In their heart. And they have not known uh, my ways. How, how, you, how you behave and how you act originates in your heart. Some of you came today and uh, you were a little miffed and you were a little naughty, if you will, with your spouse on your way to church today before you ever left the house. Uh, you, you, things weren't just right. H how did that all happen? It started with the heart. Uh, the Bible says that before we came to Christ, we had a depraved heart. Ezekiel says that we have hearts like stone. In Matthew chapter 15, the Bible says, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and blasphemies. You understand, it began in the heart, the seat, if you will, of our emotions. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, the Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The mouth speaks, but it originated in the heart. We begin to have thoughts, but those thoughts are manifested in the tongue uh, because the heart determines our actions. The heart determines our behavior. It is no wonder that the wisest man who ever lived in Proverbs chapter four cried out. He says, above all things, Guard your hearts, for it is the wellspring of life. Powerful words. Truth number three. It is possible, it is possible to push God too far. Now we know that God is patient. We know that he's good. We know that he's kind. We know that he's long-suffering. We know that he is compassionate. But folks, even a compassionate God can be pushed too far. Look at verse 11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. For the first time in the New Testament, we are discovering that God is making an oath. Not that God would ever have to make an oath, but here's the first time that he did make an oath. And what he is doing here in this passage is that he is reminding us of the seriousness of sin. We persist in sin, so he is showing us the depth and the seriousness of his response. The fact that for 40 years, 
The nation of Israel griped and complained and they didn't trust God and they didn't walk in the center of the will of God and they lived lives that were filled with selfishness. And somewhere between year 39 and year 40, God calls the angels together and he says to those angels, they don't want to enter into Canaan, then they won't enter into Canaan. You know that a sinful, unbelieving heart leads to sinful action and sinful behavior pushes God too far. Uh, I remember years ago listening to Paul Harvey. Y'all ever remember that Paul, Paul Harvey giving that little deal in the middle of the day and just I always look forward to that. He was talking one day about a little boy and his prayer life. The little boy was praying and he said, God, would you please bless mama? And God, would you take care of my daddy and bless my little sister? And God, thank you for Fido and, and, and I pray you'd bless my dog. And, and, and by the way, God, would you take care of yourself? Because if anything ever happens to you, God, we're all in big trouble. Mm. You, you see, if you know anything about the nature of God, you know that God can be pushed too far. He said, all right, I've had enough. If you'd rather be in bondage, if you'd rather be in the, by the way, he never let him go back to Egypt. He didn't let him go into Canaan, but he didn't let him go back into Egypt. If that's your desire, if that's all you're concerned about, if you're not willing to trust me and believe me for what I have in store for you, then you will never, ever, ever enter into Canaan. You'll never get there. You'll never enter into my rest. Now, there are four kinds of rest in the Bible. There is creation rest. You remember when God created everything in six days on that seventh day, and that's where we get our Sabbath from on that seventh day. The Bible says that he rested. There is the rest of redemption it is finished, God said. Uh, our plan of salvation is done. Then there's the rest of obedience. You know, there's nothing like knowing in your life that you're in the center of the will of God, that you're walking with God, that you're in total obedience to God. It brings about a rest like nothing else can ever do. Then there is the rest of eternal rest. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, as we get into the book of Hebrews. Look at verse 11 very carefully. He says, so I swear, I, I, I'm, I'm making an oath here. I'm mad about this. And I'm making an oath right now. They shall not enter into my rest. Powerful words. It, when you read that very carefully, what he is talking about here explicitly is that they will never be able to enjoy everything that I have for them to be fulfilled with while they're here in this life. Now, when you're reading about Canaan, Canaan is never representative of heaven. It is representative of, by the way, we, we, we sing about Canaan. Canaan land is just in sight. We, we, we got all kinds of writers that have written tons of music about Canaan. And, and about 99% of the time, if not 100% of the time, they're using it to reference heaven. But that is never God's intention here in the scripture. Canaan is never representative of heaven. Canaan is representative of everything that God has in store for us here in this life if we will trust him and believe him for it. I am convinced that these people did not miss heaven, but they never did realize what God had in store for them. I, I, I see this in my leadership. I see this as my role as a pastor that so many people today continually stay as a baby in Christ because they are not willing to trust God for what he has in store for them in this life. And they stay a baby and never realize the blessings of God. 
Let, let me give you truth number four. This may knock your hat in the creek. Even believers can have an unbelieving heart. You say, what? Yes, even believers can have an unbelieving heart. You say, surely not. Well, watch this in verse 12. I'll give you the first two words. You give me the third word. Take heed, brethren. He's talking to fellow believers. He's not talking to an unregenerate culture. He's talking to people that have followed the Lord in salvation. He's talking to those that have placed their faith and their trust in Christ. He's calling them out. You are my fellow believers. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Can I just say non-Christians don't have a franchise on an unbelieving heart. If, if, if truth be known and if you and I were to be honest with ourselves, honest with each other and honest with God, we all would probably say, you know what, I know that to be true because I've been there. Now we all believe that Jesus died on a cross for our sin. We all believe that he rose on the third day. We all believe that he ascended back to the Father. We have come today to worship him and to praise him and to adore him. We know that we've trusted him to wash our sins away. We know that the Holy Spirit of God resides in our life. But what do we do after that? Most of us, if we were real honest with ourselves, would say, that's where I've just squatted and I don't go any further. I call this the disease of disbelief or failing to believe God. Let, let me give you three areas. I, I, I've kind of recorded this, kind of written these down for us. Let me give you three areas of our life where we fail to believe God. First of all, we fail to believe that God will take care of our deepest needs. Uh, we, we lose our jobs. We have family discord. Uh, our teenagers go crazy. Uh, we have too much month at the end of the money and we're facing a financial crisis in our lives. And, and we say, you know what, God, I know that you can take care of this. I know that you're able to meet my needs. I know that you're more than anything that I will ever face. But when push comes to shove in those areas of our life, we think sometimes that God doesn't move as quickly as we think he ought to move, nor does he move in the area where we think that he ought to move and how that we think that God ought to move. And so we think, well, God, I know better how to run this stuff than you do. And so we take it back into our own hands. When the word says, cast all your cares on him for I care for you, the word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I were to take a poll here today and I were to ask you how many of you that are sitting here this morning can honestly and truthfully say, I believe that God can meet all my needs. The overwhelming majority of the people in this room would lift their hand and say, yes, 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 yes. God will, God can, God's able, ba, 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 ba. But we go out into the parking lot and we discover we left our lights on and the battery is dead and all of a sudden we have a panic attack because we don't have enough money to buy a new battery to put in our car and we're wondering how are we going to make it? Fail to believe that God will take care of our deepest needs. Second is fail to believe that God means what he says when he says what he means. <laughs> Say that again, preacher. It's a failure to believe that God says what he means and means what he says. You say, well, give me an example of what you're talking about. Well, that's pretty easy. And I do it with great fear and trepidation because I know what's going to go through some of your people's minds. It's the area of tithing. And even when I mention the word tithing, and no matter, I only preach on it maybe two or three times a year, and yet people in, in, in their smugness, they'll say, well, he's just trying to raise money. 
No, I'm not. I'm trying to get you to Canaan. I'm trying to help you to realize what God has in store for you. I'm trying to get you to the point where you don't sit down in the wilderness. Cognitively, we all would agree, yeah, I believe that if, if I tithe, I do believe God's going to open up the windows of heaven. I, I believe the word that he's going to pour out blessings so that we want. And I know that if I put him to test, da-da-da-da-da, uh, I know that cognitively, I know that that is accurate and true. Well, if you really believe it, why in the world is there still 75% of the people that don't do it? It's a failure to believe that God means what he says when he says what he means. The third is we don't believe that God is in sovereign control. Many Christians are just simply content to live their life as everybody else lives their life. Do you know that in Acts 27 is one of the most remarkable stories the Apostle Paul is making his journey to Rome. And he's on board this ship, it's kind of a cargo ship. And there's this huge storm that arises on the waters. And you know that it's pretty severe when they start throwing stuff overboard. The Bible talks about letting their ropes down. Whenever you see that, you know that, that, that stuff is bad. And, and, and they're thinking, we're going to all die out here. We're not any of us ever going to survive. Paul says, well, I told you you ought not to left port anyway. But now that you're out here, I just want you to know, an angel came and stood by me last night. And the angel told me that we're all going to make it. We're all going to survive. There's not anybody out here that is going uh, to die. No one is going to drown. So could I take that just for a moment and say to you, don't believe your circumstances. Don't listen to the power doubters. Don't listen to the praise poopers. Put your confidence and your trust in what thus saith the word of God and the promises that he has extended toward us. God's unhappy with people that are in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Number five. Our faithfulness, our faithfulness confirms our position in Christ. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Encourage one another today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Encourage one another. Why is that? Because somebody somewhere, matter of fact, I would venture to say that there are several over here in this section and several in this section. I've already spotted a bunch in this section and I can see some people over here in this section that they would love it if somebody would just come up and put their arm around them and say, you know what, I'm praying for you today. I, I, I want to encourage you in the Lord today. Has anybody told you that they love you? Today, do you do that with other people? I D double dog dare you this week to go just sit down and make a list of names of people that need to be, you don't even know that they need, just a list of people that maybe God puts on your heart and you just write their name down and spend a few minutes this week maybe picking up the phone and calling or sending a note. This past week I was sitting at my desk and I was doing something, I don't even remember what, but all of a sudden this name hits my mind that I haven't talked to in years. So I, I just sent him a text. And, and he responded normally years ago if I would reach out to him. It may take a few days for him to ever get back. But it, immediately he, sa he said, well, I guess you've already heard. I said, I have no idea. I was just sitting at my desk and, and, and God laid you on my heart. And I just want to tell you today I love you. He said, well, you don't know this, I guess, but I resigned my church. He was hurting. You, you know, God will lay people on your heart. Yes. Encourage one another. He says, today, don't, don't let your heart get hardened. And then he uses the phrase deceitfulness of sin. Well, you know that 
Satan is a deceiver. You are aware of that, right? He, he doesn't show you lying in the gutter, living on the streets. He, he doesn't show, but, but what he will do is he'll take a commercial on television with some fifth of Smirnoff and make you think that it is the most sexy and romantic thing that you could ever do. But he doesn't show you the end result. He doesn't show you the end result of adultery and fornication and sexual promiscuity and what it's going to do to your family and what it's going to do to your life and what it's going to do to your ministry. He doesn't show you those things. It's deceitful. Notice verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we... Here's the same thing, same thing as verse 6 that we looked at last week. He, he's not talking about I got to hold on if I'm going to be saved. He says, no, the saved are going to hold on. He's just confirming the faithfulness. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you would hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Now, let me give you the last one. It's the picture of the three deadly deeds. Deceitfulness, disobedience, disbelieving. And he says, keep them out of your life. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest. Didn't get into Canaan because they didn't believe. So we see that they could not enter into Canaan because of unbelief. Let, let me get real personal with you for just a minute. Are you stuck in the wilderness because you have failed to believe God that he can take you to the fullness of your walk with him. You know what I hurt for you and what I, what I hurt for me? I, I put my, when I say you, I didn't always remember I'm in that category. If one finger's pointing out, there are four that are pointing back in, you know. You, you know what, I, what worries me? is uh, it, it, it actually keeps me up at night sometimes. I don't want to get to heaven. And I don't want you to get to heaven and see everything that God had in store for you here in this life. But you weren't willing to trust him for it. You weren't willing to believe him for it. I said this last week and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it again today. L listen to me, listen to me. I'd rather be guilty of trusting God for too much rather than too little. Amen. I don't want to get to heaven and see everything that I missed out on. I want to enjoy it now. I want everything that God has. I want that for First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I don't believe we've touched the hem of the garment of what God wants to do in and through this ministry. I don't want us to miss anything that he has for us. Let, let me tell you, I, I, here's, what I, here's what I think about a lot of people. And I don't know whether you're one of them or not. I hope not, but it's like saving up for years and years enough money to buy a house. Okay, you, you set it aside, you saved it. Finally, you got enough to buy just the house that you've always wanted furnished it just like you always wanted it to look like. You go into the attorney's office, you sign the papers, and it's now yours. Moving day has arrived. And, and, and the moving company shows up and moves you to that location, and you get up your tent, and you set it in the front yard, and you move into the tent when you've got your house that you I think there's a lot of Christians that are just like that. God says, look what I've got for you. Trust me. Have faith in me. Believe me. Get out of that tent. Get out of the wilderness. Get into Canaan. 
Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.